you. Thanks so much for the invitation and thank you to Barbara for such a stimulating talk and to all the speakers um, from the sessions yesterday and today. Um, thanks to, to Barbara for saying stay curious at the end of your presentation because the strap line for the museum that I'm representing today is the free destination for the incurably curious. So that felt very appropriate to me. So my name's Rosie Stanbury. I'm head of the live programme at Welcome Collection in London. We're a free museum and library aiming to challenge the way that people think and feel about health, life, and our place in the world. Today, I'm going to talk to you about why I think talking to strangers is important, why museums are a great space for this, and give you some examples of how we've encouraged this in Welcome Collection. And before I get on to the main body of my talk today, I'll set some context for you on us as a venue. So we are a very new museum. This month is our 10th birthday. We have two temporary exhibition spaces, three permanent spaces, and various event spaces around our building. We also have the Welcome Library and an interdisciplinary research hub on our sixth floor. We have around 7,000 visitors a year, and we're part of Welcome, a global charitable research foundation devoted to improving health for everyone by helping great ideas to thrive. The organization that I work for was founded on the death of Sir Henry Welcome. He died in 1936 and he was a pharmaceutical businessman, he was an entrepreneur and, in, and a philanthropist and an incredible collector. He had incredibly diverse interests in relation to health and medicine and collected around two million objects relating to this in his lifetime. Now, he had quite a seemingly endless idea of what might belong in his collection. So items include surgical instruments, um, but also paintings, ancient Chinese sex stimuli, um, and uh, Napoleon's toothbrush. This is our permanent exhibition, Medicine Man, which displays a tiny, tiny, tiny proportion of Henry Welcome's collection today. So when we opened in 2007, we aimed to be a place for people over the age of 14, so predominantly geared towards an adult audience, to reimagine Henry Welcome's vision for a museum of mankind in a 21st century setting. We wanted to explore health and medicine in a very broad cultural context, in the way that he'd explored it in his lifetime. And today we do this with exhibitions, events, youth projects, digital activities, and publications. We tend to start with a big theme in which medicine has a crucial role to play, but where other perspectives are vital in order to meaningfully do justice to the subject matter. So this is the first exhibition that we opened with. It was called The Heart. And this show um, loaned multiple objects from other museums and institutions, as well as displayed objects from our own collections. In this exhibition, our historical understanding of the heart was explored through original illustrations by Leonardo da Vinci. Contemporary medicine was considered through a heart bypass machine and the symbolism of the heart was considered through contemporary art as well as country and western songs. On this slide you can see a young woman, Jennifer Sutton. She donated her own heart to be in the exhibition following a heart transplant operation and this is her coming to visit. So we tend to have quite a visceral approach in our exhibitions and have a great emphasis on personal perspectives as well as diverse expertise. To accompany this exhibition, we programmed events ranging from drumming workshops to consider the beat of the heart to a live heart surgery, where we filmed a surgical operation happening at a hospital in Cambridge and relayed it live to our audience in Welcome Collection so that they could ask the surgeon questions. From the very outset of Welcome Collection, we aim to present diverse perspectives to allow multiple interpretations of the themes that we explored. We take a non-didactic approach and encourage our audience to ask questions much more than we aim to give them answers. 
Since the heart, we've explored many different subjects, including death, sleeping and dreaming, dirt, and many others. Our tagline, as I said before, is the free destination for the incurably curious, but we don't aim to satisfy that curiosity. We very much aim to encourage it. So that gives you a sense of where I'm coming from. So why strangers? Before I tell you what I think, I'd like you to close your eyes. Thank you. I wasn't sure if you'd do that. Think about a time when you've had an important conversation with a stranger. Not a friend of a friend or someone in a work context, but a complete stranger. Not a conversation about the weather or help with travel directions, but about something important to you. Consider that encounter. What did it feel like? What did it make you think? Now put your hand up if you've had a conversation like that in the last month. Now in the last six months. Now in the last year. Now put your hand down if you were drunk at the time. <laughs> Lots of conversations with strangers happen when you're drunk, but I think that's cheaping, cheating. So, sober, convers sober conversations with strangers are a little more rare. Thank you. Put your hands down. You can open your eyes if you haven't already. So you've all had plenty of experience of this, or a few of you have anyway. But what got me thinking about it? Something monumental happened in the UK last year. On the 23rd of June 2016, we had the opportunity to take part in a national vote and decide if our future would be within or outside the EU. I went to bed that night certain that the country would vote to remain. Everyone that I knew thought that we should. I woke up in that, that morning and my heart was in my mouth. Our country had voted for Brexit. That day I got my regular train to work. I managed to get a seat, which was great because I often don't on my commuter train. And as I sat, I glanced at the, at the iPhone of the person that was sitting next to me. His Facebook feed was open and it was full of Union Jacks and St. George's flags and gleeful jubilations of a stronger future for Great Britain. I felt sick. My eyes welled up. I wanted to have a conversation with this man. I wanted to ask him why he'd voted for Brexit, assuming that he was aligned with his entire social media feed. But I couldn't. I didn't manage to speak up. The trouble is, in a public space like this, we can't just strike up conversations, not in the UK anyway. We need to have permission. Our world today is getting smaller all the time. Social media and technology gives us greater opportunities to connect with one another more than ever before, and that's incredible. But it means that we're increasingly tuning in on demand to the channels that we want to consume, to the people that we want to connect with. And we can easily forget about the perspectives that are out there that are different to our own and that are often nearby. But why should we bother? Why is it important to talk to strangers? From my perspective, it's simple, because difference is vital and it makes life more interesting. But in addition to that, we can sometimes be more honest with people that we don't know. We have fewer preconceptions. We can be stimulated by new ideas or just make a connection that might lead to something else later down the line. Or it might just be invigorating for one short moment because you agree or disagree or exchange a glance or a laugh. It might not lead to anything else, and that's fine. Moments of fleeting intimacy between two strangers can be incredible experiences that just give you a little feeling of synchronicity. So why museums? Why should we be a space for this? We have public spaces, for one. Meeting genuine strangers in private spaces is rare. We can provide a neutral space to convene, a level playing field for different people to come together and consider big ideas. We have stimuli, objects and themes that can ignite discussion and have relevance to the lives of our audiences. This might relate to belonging, to place, identity, science, health, art, the past, the present, or the future. 
and we have staff expertise in audiences and engagement. Now, parks are a fantastic place to talk to strangers, but that's not really the expertise of a park manager. He doesn't have the right expertise to engineer that. We can endeavor to understand what motivates our audiences, what will support or inha inhibit the connections that they might make with one another. Okay, so what have we done in Welcome Collection around this? We've been intentionally getting people together in a room who wouldn't have met otherwise since we opened in 2007. But these people were predominantly invited experts who we approached to take part in events around different themes. Because of our interdisciplinary approach, our programs involved a whole range of experts who might present different perspectives on whatever it was that we were investigating at the time. We wanted to give our audiences a rich insight into just how complicated the world is by presenting them with multiple expertise. So here on this slide, you can see an Islamic herbal practitioner, um, an anthropologist, a scientist, a chemist, and down here, just the other side of the photograph, is a leech farmer. And that gives you a flavor of some of the different expertise that we would bring together. Now, those invited experts shared their ideas, their knowledge and provocations with our audiences to encourage our audiences to ask questions. And we always ensured that there was lots of time for that, for that discussion and that conversation. And our audi audience always did engage. They asked more and more questions. And often, that was the most fascinating part of our events. That was when the curveballs came in that no one expected. That was the moment that our invited experts would be challenged by the lived experience and professional expertise within our audience. It was total alchemy. You never knew where the audience would take it. We did a consultation exercise with some of our regular event attendees to find out more about their experiences. And this was a fantastic process to better understand their perceptions of our program. One huge surprise came out of this for me, and I'm slightly ashamed to admit it. One of the key things that our audiences got out of attending our events was the connections that they made with one another. This is totally obvious when you think about it, but I hadn't thought about it much before. As an event producer embroiled in content development, it's easy to get slightly blinkered by that. So we began to consider what would happen if we started here? What if we were to take away that invited expertise, those carefully curated events that we spent months researching? What if we looked more towards the expertise within our audience and created more opportunities for them to share and present with one another? Now, it's important to say that we have an audience with a great investment in our subject matter. We're a venue about health, life, and our place in the world. Now, everyone has a vested interest in that. This slide is from the Association for Leading Visitor Attractions that um, evaluate various different museums, galleries, and heritage institutions in the UK. And it gives an indication of what motivates our audience. So the top gray box, which Welcome Collection is quite small on, um, are audiences who are coming to do a tick box exercise. They want to simply come and say that they have been to your museum or heritage attraction. It's kind of on their tick list. Um, the two, the purple and the blue one in the middle, uh, that we're slightly stronger on are around... Um, audiences that are, have a special focus, so they're coming to see a special exhibition or an event, or a topic focus, so an interest in the subject matter of the venue. So we wanted to create more opportunities for our audience to connect, but we didn't just want to add social elements to our program. For us, it had to be enga about engagement with the subject matter, just in a slightly different way to how we'd done it historically. Now, this was slightly outside of my comfort zone, so I talked to this wonderful woman. Um, the person with the microphone there is called Lois Weaver. 
Um, she's a director, uh, a performer, an activist, and a professor of performance at Queen Mary University London. Like me, she'd struggled for a long time with experts being presented on a platform with the most interesting parts of the conversation getting cut short in the Q&A with the audience. She, so she developed some pu new public engagement methodologies to scramble this and to frame more, more events around the expertise within the audience. She developed something called the long table. And she'd already developed this methodology before I made the approach to her. It's one of the reasons why I got in touch. She trialed it in various performance art, performance and gallery contexts, and also community contexts. The long table is an experiment combining performance and round table discussion. The event is open-ended and non-hierarchical. And it was inspired by Marlene Goris's film, Antonia's Line, where the protagonist continually extends her dinner table to invite more and more outsiders and eccentrics into her home until the table gets so big that it has to be moved outside. So the long table is a dinner party structured by etiquette where conversation is the only course. On entry, audience members receive this sheet of etiquette which is just there. Then, their greeting them is a table with 12 chairs around it. It has a white tablecloth, which is paper, which can be written or drawn on, and there are microphones on the table, around three. The table's lit to give a sense of atmosphere. And surrounding that long table is an additional audience of around 60 people. In our case, it could be more. So the audience come in and they sit down. They might sit down at the table or they might sit down in the audience chairs. The event starts when a host outlines the etiquette and then it begins. It is not facilitated. Anyone can take part in the conversation. To do so, they just have to join the table and pick up a microphone. If the table's full, they can just tap someone on the shoulder and take their seat. People join and leave the table throughout the event and have one long conversation for around two hours. As the etiquette says, there can be silence, there might be awkwardness, there could always be laughter. As no one is facilitating, there is an end but no conclusion, no summing up. We originally worked with this format when we had an exhibition on called The Institute of Sexology, which was about the history of the study of sex. This was in 2014. Now everyone has a perspective on sex, right? The suspense in the room was absolutely palpable. Not everyone got up to the table to speak. But as an audience member, that possibility makes you sit up and listen in a different way. You don't have to participate, but you do have an active body in that space because you're held in anticipation of what will happen next because no one knows how it will unfold. It's not predictable. These events confirmed our belief in the great potential of our audience. And at the time, we were developing um, new parts of our building through a building development project. And these long tables were aligned with ambitions for a new space that we were building, um, where we would give over more control to our audiences. Before entering into our building development project, we knew from our evaluation that around 40% of our audience left Welcome Collection wanting to know more about our subject matter. But very few of them became members of the Welcome Library, which is a huge resource. It's the second largest history of medicine library in the world. So as part of our building development, we wanted to create a new space that was a kind of bridge between our public offer of exhibitions and events and our library offer that people had to become members of. So we developed this. This is our reading room. We wanted to make a space that was not constrained by a curated exhibition narrative, but somewhere that our audience had to navigate on their own terms, just like you do have to in a library. It has over a thousand books in it, so it is partly a library. It has incredible objects, so it's partly an exhibition space, and it has over 50 seats in it, and it has a warm, luxurious domestic tone, so it's a space to sit in and linger and explore for yourself. 
There are 10 broad themes in the space, including things like breath, the body, lives, travel, the mind, and these inform different niches. The different niches have objects, they have books, they have handling objects, and they have games that our audience can play. Of course, the team working on this spent space spent lots of time thinking about how to encourage interactions between audience members. But we knew that we'd have to create activities to seed behavior in this space because as it was such an unusual space, audience, audiences wouldn't know how to behave. So we planned a strand of pop-up events. These events happen within the space and people gather around the small niches of tables and chairs while other, other members of the audience are just milling around. These events were different from past strands of programming for a few different reasons. First of all, they just pop up. We don't tell our audience about them beyond the building. With them, we intend to try and provide our audience with unexpected opportunities to delve deeper into our content. Someone might come into the museum for a cup of coffee or to see an exhibition and then end up having a conversation with a surgeon at an event in the reading room, or in this case, um, performance artist Joshua Sofa uh, in a project that he was running about our founder's nose. Secondly, these events are unpredictable. We don't know how many people are going to turn up because we don't advertise for them in advance and we don't ticket for them. Our target audience is just 10 people. Um, but we expect between two people and 50 people. And lastly, these events have to draw on the expertise of our audience as much as whoever is leading or facilitating the activity. This way, audience members have more chances to connect with one another and get their own voices heard. So we were surprising our audiences with these small-scale activities all the time. And the scale and the intimacy of these events meant that people had an opportunity to encounter a stranger and discover something new, but we wanted something more. We wanted our audiences to drive the agenda further. So in 2015, we launched something called Open Platform. We invited anyone at all to propose an activity to take place in our reading room. We asked that they abide by the rules that we set for the space and that the event had to involve the audience. So standard lectures or promotional activities were not accepted. We were also specific in that the activity had to last for just one hour. Now this was low risky because the scale was small but it felt really scary. So how do we go about it? First of all, we're really transparent about the process. We have the rules for engagement up on our website and we have leaflets in the space to tell people about it. My colleague Valerie, who runs the Reading Room program, sits in the space around three times a month and these times are advertised on our website and we suggest that anyone who wants to come and propose an idea to run in the Reading Room should come and talk to her about the opportunity of Open Platform, see the space so that she can support them to think about what it means to create an event in this particular space. Then they have to fill in a short form, it's two sides of A4 on what they want to do and why they want to do it. And these ideas are considered by a small working group made up of very different people from across my whole organization and they're considered once a month we have around an 80% acceptance rate, so we try and say yes to as many ideas as possible. If the person applying has very little experience of public engagement or if they're keen to learn more, we offer facilitation training, which is bespoke training that we've developed for this space and it lasts a whole day. And it's aligned to the philosophy of the space that we're trying to develop. Then the event can happen any time that we can fit it in. We try to have a quick turnaround on these, unlike other strands of the program where we're planning for months in advance. Now, seeing what has come in and see it happen in the space has been totally eye-opening. Last week, we had a laryngectomy choir. So this is a choir made up of people that have had their voice box removed. They came to perform in the space and have a conversation about body language and communication. A few months ago, a different open platform event was run by an artist with dyspraxia. This is a neurological condition that impacts coordination. It just so happened that another person with dyspraxia was in the audience. They'd just seen the sign and come along to the event that day. And it was him and various other people that didn't really know that much about the condition. 
And he said that dyspraxia for him was like being a fish trying to climb a tree. Being a fish trying to climb a tree. What a powerful metaphor to share with a random group of strangers who weren't expecting to attend an event on that day. It's been such a joy to see the people who've come to take part in Open Platform, to see the different interpretations that our audience want to bring us, and I'm excited to see where it goes next. Of course, we all have incredible knowledge within our institutions, amazing objects, curators, ideas, and connections, and of course, we want to share that with our audience. But today, I encourage you to go back to your institutions and find out more about your audiences. They are one of your greatest assets. What knowledge might they have that they want to share with one another that fits within your organizational objectives? How could you create a framework that helps them to do that? As well as the knowledge of your museum, one of the greatest gifts that you could give to them might be each other. I urge you to try if you haven't already. I guarantee you'll be surprised and invigorated along the way. Thank you. <laughs>